Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome back to the closet. Back to our closet. We've been on the road. We've been out in nature, yep. having adventures, working out in parking lots and doing updates from <laughs> a single chair. <laughs> Here we are back in the closet. We should have just done one chair in this one. Just oh, to kind maybe of ease just back always. Yeah. People love seeing us. <laughs> no, that's not great. <laughs> uh, today, featuring kind of a new thing we have going yeah. to make it easier for people to get Brio swag and gear and stuff whenever they want, mm -hmm. which is an online apparel store where you can pick whatever you want click and it just anytime gets delivered straight to your door. Right. Super convenient rather than waiting on me to have the time to organize an apparel order, which really only happens like maybe twice a year. Yeah. So all kinds of cool stuff are available in there right now. Some summer items. We got some sweet Brio slides. They're pretty comfy. I like those ones. Yep. Um, we did other cool items. This is a beach towel with the Brio stuff on it. I think it turned out really cute. I'm very pleased in general with how these things turned out. Yeah. The summer stuff is available for order um, until the end of August. Right. So if you want any of those items, go ahead and get in there now. And then we'll be switching to like the fall and winter toques and sweaters and hats and all that. Cross country skis. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> I'd have to actually learn how to cross country ski mm. then. A Brio snowboard. That'd be sweet. That would be cool. I would totally ride one of those. Can I sponsor myself <laughs> as a <laughs> sponsored athlete? Sweet. So back in the closet. Yeah. Today we're gonna talk about something that I think affects all of us at some point. Yeah. And that's back pain. Back pain. I've dealt with it. You've dealt with it. Many people will struggle with back pain at some point in their lives. Yeah. So we're gonna go through kind of the basic anatomy of the spine and the core, the, where pain tends to stem from, the common causes or sources of the back pain, and hopefully how we can either prevent or rehab or alleviate existing back pain. Right. So I don't know where I heard this analogy from, and I should try to remember these things because I always want to give credit when it wasn't an original idea, that the spine is like a stack of oranges, mm -hmm. like Christmas oranges just kind of stacked up. So it's very, on its own, very unstable. Right. So all your little vertebrae are like stacks of oranges. Then they have these little squishy cushioning discs between each one to prevent the bones from grinding on the bones. And it's supposed to be able to have some movement, yeah. but then the structure around it is mostly to prevent movement. Right. It's And there's a lot of movement. It'll twist and bend and you know all kinds of movement that happens in the spine. Mm -hmm. Generally, the more open the joint, the more movement it has. So your shoulder has a ton of movement ability, right? It's a very Range open joint. But that also means it's more prone to injury than anything else. So for us to be able to like get up and move around and do all the different types of things we do, um, we need a lot of movement in our spine. Mm -hmm. Like it's an evolutionary trade-off, yeah. right? Like if we just had a rod, like a fused spine, we would never have back pain and back problems, but we also wouldn't be able to do a lot of basic movements like get out of bed or, right. you know, move or twist or change directions easily. So yeah. it's this evolutionary trade-off and it's it's a very cool system. Yeah. So the, the primary role of the muscles of the core. And we can define that not just as the abs, but obliques, spinal erectors, and even sometimes people put the hip flexors in there too, is to prevent movement. Yeah. Uh, this is literally something I write on a whiteboard when I teach the level one courses. Midline stability is synonymous with core strength. You can in use those two terms interchangeably. And it's our contention in CrossFit that the primary role of the core muscles is to resist or recover from undue flexion and hyperextension of the spine. Right. So it's to prevent movement. Right. So Not imagine imagine your spine is like a cell phone tower and then your muscles are the guy wires that are going down to those other points of contact. And they're they're not meant to move around. They're meant to like stabilize and prevent um, unnecessary movement from mm -hmm. the spine. Anchoring your spine to your pelvis. Yeah. Guy wires. And if, if you ever look at an anatomy drawing, that's what core muscles look like. They don't look like flexors, like flexor muscles are round, bulgy, like biceps yeah. or hamstrings, like they're meant to flex a joint. The muscles of the core generally are not. We did a whole episode on abs specifically yeah. of like what they're for, how to train them. But we're going to talk more about just the back. Right. So the anatomy of the back, we've got the stack of oranges, we've got the squishy discs and we've got the muscles and then therefore the tendons and ligaments that attach the muscles to the bone and then bones to bones. Right. So the pain can stem from dysfunction in, in any of those parts. Right. Obviously catastrophic back injuries, you can usually from like an impact accident, you can break the bone of the vertebrae. Right. It's a severe enough break. It damages the spinal cord. And that's, that's big trouble. Big trouble. You can also have like compression fractures in the vertebrae, like a hairline fracture where you can break your back, but mm -hmm. you're, it hasn't damaged the spinal cords. You're not yep. 
um, you're not paralyzed. Even excessive uh, excessive stre- uh, excuse me stretching and movement. Um, when we did that back health seminar, they X-rayed not there, but they talked about X-raying some like elite level contortionists mm-hmm. and gymnasts and stuff. And they were counting all the different hairline fractures through the spine from them just like moving like well beyond what the human is supposed to do. So mm-hmm. those people that can like lick their own back, it comes <laughs> at a cost, you know, yeah. it's not meant to be that much movement. So at the, the protrusions in the back, you have a little, they're called facet joints. So if you did an extreme back bend, those bones start to crash into each other. Yeah. So, um, obviously we're not <laughs> contortionists <laughs> <laughs> dealing with those kinds not of things. Not professionally. Not professionally. Yeah. Um, so you can have problems with the discs. Mm-hmm. The disc is like a little donut sort of shape thing, cushions the vertebrae. It's um, It's got kind of a rubbery texture outside and a gel cushiony inside. So you can have problems with the disc starting to protrude mm-hmm. forwards or backwards or to the either side. You can have full um, where the encasing of the disc ruptures and the gel inside extrudes. Um, that's exceptionally painful. You can have herniations you can have minor bulges related to the discs um and and often those those cause pain because that disc is pushing up against a nerve mm -hmm. and that's just causing chronic pain all the time yeah sending that pain signal hitting the nerve yeah and then the tendon or ligament problems you can have strains of the attachments yeah just like you can just like you can micro tear or even rupture you know your bicep tendon or whatever you can have small little micro tears or you know, bigger problems within those teeny tiny little tendons and ligaments that are holding your spine together. And then another common one is the SI joint. Yeah, that's a super common one right at the very bottom. Whenever anybody has that real weird low back pain, when Mm -hmm. people refer to the SI joint, that's that's really down there. Sacroiliac. So your sacrum is sort of a triangle shaped bone at the bottom of, you know, below your lumbar vertebrae. And then your iliac is like your hip. So your sacroiliac joint, Mm -hmm. and you can have all kinds of irritation or dysfunction in that joint. You can have injuries or inflammation in that joint that can cause lots of exceptionally low back pain that often comes along with like a zingy pain down your leg Mm -hmm. related to like some nerve stuff happening down your leg. So bone problems, disc problems, um, tendon or ligament problems, and then joint dysfunction, generally SI joint yeah. dysfunction. Discs. Discs. Um, so causes of pain, what causes those things yeah, that we just listed? Chronically, if we're talking about sort of normal people stuff, not setting major accidents and that kind of stuff aside, mm-hmm. uh, poor posture. Yeah. <laughs> and most people <laughs> experience back process. pain. But yeah, if you look at the <laughs> back is all rounded right now. Most people that are inactive, especially, or have very sedentary jobs. That's the main thing is, is they just have poor posture. Mm -hmm. So your spine isn't meant to be perfectly flat. There is a curvature of the spine, but we tend to either exaggerate those curves or we sort of reverse what they're supposed to be doing. And we just hold those things for really long periods of time. So when you're sitting in a chair or in a desk, you've got a pelvic tilt, right? Which is like an excessive pelvic tilt that's forcing your hip flexors to tighten up and your low back to get uncomfortable. And it's just a bad position to stay in. Mm -hmm. And people will do that for eight hours of the day. Yeah. So I think most people can recognize nice posture and it's becoming more and more rare. So when you notice it, you're like, oh, sometimes (laughs) it's a, like a ballerina or dance, like someone that carries themselves with good posture. Yeah. Generally people can recognize shoulders back, chin up and neutral, belly pulled in. So we don't have that kind of like spilling our guts forward, slouchy shoulders forward, head carriage. Yeah. So the kind of three parts of the spine, the lumbar curve has a natural little like gentle C shape. The thoracic or like mid back, upper back is pretty straight. And then the C spine at the neck has a little curve as well. So it's got this natural S curvature of the spine. Like you said, it's not supposed to be rod straight. And that kind of distributes the weight in a mechanically advantageous position. So what most of us do is slouch the upper back. So the muscles on the back side are too weak. Mm-hmm. The muscles on the front side are too tight. And so it pulls us into a bad position at the, at the top. Uh, they call it, they used to call it doctor head. <laughs> doctor head. The forward head carriage. Okay. Now they're calling it tex neck. Oh, Cause yeah. it's like this, you're like, yeah. your head is forward of your <laughs> center. Your noggin is heavy. Oh yeah. So if you're carrying it forward of the base, it puts a tremendous amount of sp- stress, like spread over the structure. Yeah. Um, Chronic sitting, like you mentioned, tightens up your hip flexor. So then you have problems at the lumbar spine, the low back stuff gets pulled into 
Um, it's called lordosis, too much curvature of the low back, mm -hmm. which do, again, doesn't, it distributes the weight improperly onto the discs of the lumbar spine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is something I got told once. Poor daily movement. Yeah. So generally when somebody's going to do a lift or something, they tend to pay attention to what they're doing. But then if you watch them putting the plates on the bar or picking something up off the ground or something that's just like, you don't even think about it. It's just a train wreck. Mm -hmm. you know, there's like rounded backs and like head hanging and just, you know, yeah. terrible, terrible positioning. So Lifting we, with the small muscles of the back, not the legs. Yeah. So you were experiencing some back pain and we went and saw Stu McGill talk and you asked <laughs> him, you're like, I don't know why my back is sore. And he watched you do a lift and he watched you kind of put the bar together. And he's like, you move perfectly. He's like, but when you're doing other things, you move like a disaster. He's like, that's what's causing your back pain. This is what he said to me. Cause we'd been in this conference room together. This was back in like maybe 20, 12, 13, the first time we met Dr. McGill. Mm -hmm. He is like the world expert in spinal biomechanics. He's the man. Runs a thing called BackFit Pro. He was a professor uh, in Ontario. And then which university he was at is escaping me. Retired now. Anyway. Yeah, I'm like, I was big into weightlifting at the time. I'm like, Dr. McGill, can you just watch me lift and see, like, tell me what the problem is here. He watched me do a few snatches and he's like, here's the deal. Your lifts are impeccable. You just move so poorly the rest of the time. And I was like, ugh, it hurts. Ouch. And he was dead right. He's like, I've been watching you move all day. He's like, every time you pick up your backpack or you yeah. sit in a chair. So it was basically like I got told that I move like hot garbage unless I'm paying attention yeah. and then I move impeccably. So I was yeah. like, ugh. But so it was very harsh and uh, a truth, a harsh truth I very much needed to hear and had to address. Every movement counts. Yeah. Every time you hinge over to brush your teeth, every time I would pick up one of my kids, every time I pick up my backpack, your body does not know the difference between this is a rep in the gym mm -hmm. and this is you doing yard work. Like yeah. every rep matters. Your body doesn't know the difference. And what's funny is whenever I've had back pain, it tends to like, you know, my muscles will seize up and everything just doesn't work properly. And it puts me into this like perfect <laughs> posture and I can't help but do it because it's painful anywhere else. And so I'll go to like, have to pick something up off the ground and it's like the most perfect you know deadlift positioning just because if i'm in any other position my body's just gonna like stop me from doing it so you have no buffer for poor movement yeah so your muscles seize up and put you where you're supposed to be and then you end up being stuck there mm -hmm. that's why people have perfect posture but they're like, i can't move my back is too sore you know yeah so all the things we've mentioned so far have to do with all the hours that you're not in the gym which is the vast majority of the time you're in the gym maybe three to five hours a week yeah. You're out of the gym the entire rest of the time. So that's the big focus. And sure. then there is lifting with crappy form in the gym. Right. One of the worst things you can do for your back is flex your spine under load. So flexion is rounding my back forward, like slouching. Yeah. So if I set up nicely for a deadlift, but as I start to lift, my back flexes under load. That is literally, if I wanted to bulge a disc, that's how you would do it. Yeah. You would put flexion pressure under load and you would, that's, you would extrude the disc to the side, to the back, to the front, whichever direction it's going. Yeah. So crappy gym form is, is another one. Um, and then I think a lesser appreciated one is overtraining sit-ups, yeah. spinal flexion. I remember having a conversation with a member who was doing sit-ups after every workout. They would like grab a, you know, an ab a mat and do like a hundred sit-ups. I'm like, eventually kind of noticed this was happening frequently. I'm like, what are you doing? And they were like, well, I just, you know, I want to get better, stronger abs. And I was like, Ooh, what you, what you are actually accomplishing is a, is a weak point in your back. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're training for back injury, not stronger core. Yeah. Um, so definitely not you, the, Role of the abdominals as flexors is there. They yeah. can pull your spine into flexion. It's how you get out of bed in the morning. But the primary role of the abdominals, the core, is to resist and recover from undue flexion and extension of the spine. Yeah. So you need to train the primary role 90% of the time, and then 5 or 10% of the time, whatever, you can do some sit-ups. Yeah. But you can't do that every day. It, think of it like a piece of metal. Bend and flex and bend and flex and bend and flex. Eventually, it just goes snap because yeah. you just created a weak point. Yeah. And you have to have the balance front to back, right? You can't mm -hmm. just do, you know, abs all the time and then barely ever chain, train your posterior chain and expect <coughs> to have good posture or good strength. You know, it's just you're tightening the front and you're weakening the back. Mm -hmm. Like if you can do 50 GHD sit-ups unbroken, but you can't do 50 hip extensions with good control, yeah. you've got a serious imbalance there. Yeah, for sure. You've got to make sure you're training both sides of the body yeah. equally. 
Okay, so let's talk about some of the remedies. That's like the mechanical stuff. Yeah. So poor posture. Uh, you just need to stand up straight yeah. or sit up straight. <laughs> <laughs> but the impairments to a better position is, is again, we need to pay attention to the front and the back. Right? Yeah. And I think people will, maybe they'll catch themselves in a mirror or they'll like their back will start to get sore and they'll sort of stand up and do this sort of stretch type thing. But try to start from the top, right? It's all about your head. Even if you're pulling your shoulders back, but your head is forward like this, like this isn't good posture. <laughs> That's awkward. Either. So you need to like lift the head, like keep that chin back and out of the way. I move my microphone with me as I sit up straight. <laughs> uh, pull the chin back and like sit up tall. And even if you can just spend, you know, half the time like this, and then when you need to relax, you can kind of take a break. But mm-hmm. get up, move around, pay attention to what is going on with your, your body. Mm-hmm. So you generally need to strengthen the muscles of the mid and upper back Mm -hmm. and you need to stretch the muscles of the chest and shoulders the front this stuff in the front gets very tight when we sit too slouchy or stand too slouchy all the time and the muscles in the back are very weak because they're not doing their job to resist gravity so when you strengthen the back stretch the front if you chronically sit you have a desk job or a driver or something you need to move every hour yeah you need to get your hips out of this flexed position your hip flexors will tighten and then you'll have a much harder time being in a good posture position like when you go to the gym or you want to run or anything. Yeah. So move every hour. And we talked about this a little bit when we were discussing like getting more steps in and just being more active in the day, right? Like when you're on the phone, walk around or Mm -hmm. or whatever, um, get up and and just move every hour, you know. I always tell people drink more water and you have to pee every hour so it makes you get up out of your chair. Um, and then stretch your hip flexor. So couch stretch yeah. is a good one. Uh, you, if you sit a lot, you need to hit that one every day, a couple times a day, maybe. Yeah. Um, do some good full range of motion squats, sit, hang out in a squat, decompress your low back, stretch your ankles, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, poor daily movement. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, everyone that comes to Brio knows what good movement is. Yeah. <laughs> now it's on you to do it when yeah. the coach is not looking. So and I guess that's nothing more than like, you just have to pay attention. Yeah. You just have to make yourself do it. When you're loading up a plate, you don't just round your back and pick it up. You kind of like set yourself like you're doing a deadlift and you pick mm-hmm. it up and you clean it onto the bar and you're good to go. Like we talk about things in the gym are these like relatively perfect objects. They're not throwing a tantrum. They're not awkward. The weight is evenly distributed. You get to take your time to approach them. So the stuff in the gym is it's easy, mm-hmm. relatively easy to move with good form. Real life, you got all kind. Your real life is almost all awkward lifting. Yeah, you're carrying patio stones into your backyard. You're wheelbarrowing. You're lifting your kid or your dog off the floor. Bags of dog food or water softener, salt, or like all kinds of awkward stuff, right? So, as important as it is in the gym with regular, nice, easy, clean objects, it's ten times more important in real life with awkward objects. Yeah, but you guys understand the principles. Yeah, flat back, use your legs. You know, drive your feet through the floor. The good thing about having a good solid foundation, like a good core, is that when you do get into a bad position, you're way less likely to actually hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. We watched the sandbag event at the CrossFit Games this year, and they were lifting hundreds of pounds in some horrendous (laughs) positions up onto the shoulder. But they all have crazy strong cores, and they're able to handle a a bit of a lean back with a big sandbag on their chest. Mm -hmm. Um, If you watched the second last event, they, the guys were doing 600 pound yoke carries, you know, and it's like they, they can brace, they can stabilize, um, when they need to. And then when they do get into a bad situation once in a while, it's not an instant injury where mm-hmm. if, if somebody just has like nothing but, you know, sourdough in their, <laughs> in their midsection, they get, they can get into a bad position once and it throws their back out. You have no buffer, no buffer, no buffer for bad movement. Um, and then in the gym and I feel like I've been trying to work on this a lot lately. Every time I've been coaching deadlift day Mm -hmm. on teaching people how to brace the core. And there is some serious technique or like mental mind body connection stuff that has to happen. You need to create 360 degrees of stiffness around your core. And it comes from intra abdominal pressure pushing out. So you take a big breath in and you go and you blow it down into your belly. I always tell people to make the noise like they're going to throw up, Mm -hmm. make a noise like you're going to barf and then feel what that does to your core. And it's, not just the abdominals, it's the spinal erectors on the back and it's the obliques on the sides. And to, for me, that was a missing piece for a lot of years was I was always focusing on like, you know, bracing my abs. My back muscles are giant. That was never a problem. Yeah. But I was always failing to activate 
the obliques on the sides. And then I would have back pain on one side. Yeah. So, cause my hips were probably shifting up and down horizontally while I was squatting or deadlifting. Um, so bracing out in all directions, 360 degrees of force is key for like a heavy squat, a heavy deadlift. Yeah. That is your built-in weight belt. It goes all the way around. Yeah. And anytime we're going to do a heavy lift, I always like to have people do some like side planks, some front planks and the like slightly shoulders off the ground uh, laying on your back just mm-hmm. to feel the core on each side mm-hmm. contracting and be like, okay, now we need to mimic those movements, those feelings when we go and approach the bar. Mm-hmm. Another interesting trick that I like, it's called the Valsalva maneuver. If you take your tongue and press it to the roof of your mouth and feel your abs at the same time, you can't do that. Press your tongue to the roof of your mouth without flexing or bracing your abs. Right. And you also can't do that and slouch at the same time. Cause if I'm slouching with my head forward and I try to create upward pressure of the tongue to the roof of my mouth, I'm, I'm automatically going to sit up straight. Mm. Weird. It is weird. Isn't it? I love that one though. Yeah. So you're, resting tongue posture, which sounds like a crazy person thing to talk about (laughs) is important for multiple reasons. And I, anything involving bracing the core, there's like a gradient, right? So you're standing in line at the grocery store. Your core muscles are on at like a three out of 10. You're doing a one rep max deadlift. Those things are on at a 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Same thing with something, you know, sort of simple, like your resting tongue posture. If you're just sitting and typing or driving, you should be mouth closed tongue gently pressed to the roof of your mouth. Yeah. It's going to make you breathe through your nose, which has all kinds of other benefits. We could do a whole podcast on breathing. It's also going to keep your posture right. in a good position where if you're a mouth breather, <laughs> you know, it's like it comes with all kinds of up and downstream effects to your brain and to your posture. So right. keep your mouth closed. Keep your mouth closed. Keep your tongue on the roof of your mouth <laughs> as oh. much as you can. That's just a funny little trick. Um, but I think about it all the time. Yeah. And then, so learn to properly brace your core when you are doing a heavy lift. Yep. If you recognize that your core needs more work, um, like I said before, the accessory movement is not more sit-ups. Yeah. No, it's um, static, isolation, isometric contraction stuff. Yeah. Also with movement, something that happens more commonly in CrossFit than a lot of other things is when you're doing like higher volume barbell cycling type stuff. If somebody can move really well they can go pretty fast cycling clean and jerks or snatches or whatever and there's some sort of magic to being able to breathe while you're Mm -hmm. moving because if you're going to do a set of 15 light power snatches you're not going to hold your breath for the whole time and if you do you're going to pass out so there's there's a magic to being able to like steady breathe while still bracing your core and hinging from the hips and like moving well Mm -hmm. so when somebody's newer or not super efficient they really need to slow that pace down to be able to pay attention to the core and kind of set up in the right position because rushing through it's just going to let things get sloppy and breathe and And not die yeah exactly um so the accessory movements the static hold stuff if you do want to work on your core yeah what are the go-tos planks are such an easy one that you can do anywhere front planks, side planks, just static holds, right? Bracing your core, squeezing your butt, you know, keeping everything rigid. Mm-hmm. And then if you have the the opportunity, you can do things like farmer carries, um, yoke carries, even just standing with a heavy bar on your shoulders, you know, anything like that where you're bracing a, a heavy load without movement. It's interesting when you pick up a yoke or just like a heavy bar out of a rack, if you pay attention, automatically your core organizes itself into yep. the position it has to be in. If you're like what's a good spinal position? Throw 300 pounds on your back and try yeah. to stand it up out of the rack. That's it. Because your body won't let you do anything different. Yeah. Um, after I had dash, especially my back was like pretty messed up and pretty weak. I had two C-sections and nerve damage from the second one. And my core doesn't work great. Mm-hmm. There was no flexing or even squatting under load. So no deadlifting, no squatting in my life for quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, but I did a lot of that stuff. Yo carries, farmer carries, everything that was upright, no flexion under load. Um, and just working on bracing it in the upright position, yeah. not working against gravity until much later. Yeah. So that was a lot of my rehab. So I still have a, a fond place in my heart for pharma carries and yo carries. And yeah. And even people that don't have a C-section like the, what is it, diastasis and mm-hmm. every, anything where your abs basically just like shut down and go to the side. <laughs> we'll see you in a few months. One of us is over here. One yeah. of us is over here. All of that like rebuilding takes time and mm-hmm. patience. Yeah. We do a whole podcast episode on recovering from making a human. Yeah. The whole <laughs> thing in and of itself. Um, okay. So just to recap the mechanical stuff, 
fix your poor posture, yeah. strengthen the back, stretch the front, avoid chronic sitting, move yeah. around. And then if you do sit a lot, stretch your hip flexors. Yep. Pay attention to all of your, all of your movement. Every yep. movement counts. Every movement throughout every waking minute of your day. Yeah. Loading up a bar, picking stuff up off the ground, everything. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess even loading the bar was in the gym, but, and this is my challenge to people. The last time we deadlifted, we'd gone through all this stuff on bracing the core and then we were starting to load. And I was like, Hey guys, my challenge to you is to load the bar with a flat back today. Mm -hmm. It absolutely pains me to watch a class of people that just spent 20 minutes working on proper hinging mechanics, yeah. go to load a bar and their back looks like the pooping dog. And they're like <laughs> putting 45 pounds on the bar. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> Um, so in the gym for sure. But I mean like general daily movement Yeah. at home, at work, in your garden, pay attention. You guys know the mechanics. You just got to make your brain do it. Yeah. Um, obviously learn to brace your core for good gym mechanics. If you do want to do some accessory stuff, it's planks and farmer carries bird dogs too. Yeah. We work those a lot. Just it's like a plank, but with some cross yeah. stability before we move on. One other thing I want to add about, we said stretching, stretch the front, you know, chest and shoulders, hip flexors. If you're tight, there is a point of diminishing marginal returns with back pain. It's possible to be too flexible. Right. And this was, it's not as common, but it's, it happens. Um, more isn't more. So if you're already very flexible or pretty flexible and you're like, my back hurts, I must need to stretch my hips more. Possibly no. Mm -hmm. And this was me. So I'm saying this from like a personal perspective. I was super flexible when I started CrossFit. I'd been mega into yoga for several years. So it's very bendy which was the cause or source of a bunch of my back pain in the beginning because I had excess range of motion and yep. I didn't have the strength to control it well. Yeah. So I, since I've started CrossFit, have had to get less flexible. It's kind of a, a funny anecdote. So when we teach the level ones, there's a whole lecture on the GHD machine. And one of the things we teach is a back extension, so a spinal extension. And we're supposed to be able to demonstrate pulling your lumbar spine into flexion, not under load, under a isolated unloaded environment most of us on the seminar staff really struggle to demonstrate lumbar spinal flexion because we're all decently strong people mm -hmm. one of my co-workers pete uh was just at the crossfit games on a team a guy can deadlift like 600 pounds that dude's lumbar spine doesn't move <laughs> nor should it because he can deadlift 600 pounds yeah and i remember uh Dr. McGill saying, you need to be only as flexible as the demands of your sport and no more. Excess right. range of motion is a hindrance, not a help. Yep. Um, so if you're on the, the side of, you know, sort of our dancers or, you know, gymnasts and stuff with great excessive flexibility, maybe it's your mission to get less flexible if you yeah. want to be able to deadlift heavy loads. Yeah. And it's okay to PSA. be able, like, I remember when you, I think it might've been Chris Spieler even that talked to you about your deadlift position where you would hyperextend your back. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you can't move in those positions. It's just that when you're lifting, you need to be able to like neutralize the mm -hmm. spine, right? You shouldn't be hyperextended and you shouldn't be flexed over and hunched over. You need to find that middle ground where you're just like in a solid position and that's Neutral. where you lift from. Yeah. So it's fine if you can move there as long as you can be stable in the positions you need to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So then we get into some of the other stuff that can be yeah. causes of back pain. Next one would be sleeping. sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> you spend a lot of your life sleeping. Yeah. Um, we have these beautiful overpriced cushy beds that we all yeah. love. And sometimes they're really bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, didn't we all just evolve like sleeping on the forest floor? Yeah. How did people deal with that? Yeah. I don't know. I, I've known many people that were very outdoorsy and they literally couldn't sleep on a mattress. You know, they just, they sleep on the floor. They sleep on a very thin little like air pad or whatever, because mm -hmm. it's just they're They spend so much time in the wilderness that beds are terrible for them. Mm -hmm. And so like your best sleeping position is meant to be on your back, just neutral spine and, you know, mm -hmm. arms at the side. But very few of us actually. Like what kind of psychopath sleeps like I know. that? I can't do that. The very few of us actually sleep in that position. Yeah. I can't sleep like that. I am a side sleeper and unfortunately a face down sleeper. <laughs> I kind of go between the two. <laughs> so back in my massage days, if we ever had to massage like a pregnant woman or somebody with like a very large belly, um, you would often have to get them on their side and you would always bolster the knees. You always have to put something between the knees because having your knees together, especially when you have wide hips, it just causes everything to kind of twist and get mm -hmm. into a bad position. And so when you're sleeping, same thing, you need to have a pillow 
or a stuffy maybe, I don't know, some kind of <laughs> bolster between your knees to sort of lift things up and put things in a better position. So if you're a side sleeper, something between the knees. People will find that very helpful. Super helpful. Propping up the knee if you're a side sleeper. If your bed is too soft yeah. and your spine just sort of droops into a mattress that's too soft, that can be a problem. If you can become some kind of psychopath that can train yourself to sleep Great. neutral on your back. You also need a pillow that supports a neutral neck position, not yeah. too high or too low or yeah, propping your head up too high. If you're a side sleeper, you need a thicker pillow. If you're sleeping on your back, you need a smaller pillow. Well, actually, mm -hmm. interesting. When I was in the hospital, uh, when I broke my leg, um, I was on my back the whole the first time. first time as a kid. <laughs> when I got hit by the car. Um, I was on my back with my leg in, in traction and they wouldn't let me have a pillow because even that slight lean with my head up in the air would like change everything on the way down. And mm. so it would like change the way my bone was healing. So I had to spend a month without a pillow. God. And then when they finally did give me a pillow, it was basically like three sheets of paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the tiniest little thing. And I was used to sleeping with this like big fluffy pillow. Yeah. Um, it was really hard to, to deal with, but that helps your, your body stay in a better position. So mm -hmm. first of all, try to move towards a, a more firm mattress if you can. Then ideally try to train yourself to sleep on your back. But if that's impossible for you, like it is for most of us, um, bolster the leg. If you're a side sleeper, if you're a face down sleeper, it, there's basically like not a lot <laughs> you can do. That's just like, it's just bad for your back. I know um, Dr. Julie Darchuk, yep. chiropractor at her clinic. She had um, a special pillow that she was recommending mm -hmm. that was good for neck posture. That, uh, you know, a few of the people in the gym were trying that out. So yep. um, yeah, you can see a specialist chiropractor. They can recommend how to get you in the right position for your spinal health. Yep. Um, then we get into, there's sort of two more categories I want to talk about with back pain. And I think they're the often completely ignored, overlooked, underappreciated causes, mm -hmm. sources mm -hmm. of back pain. Uh, guess what I'm going to talk about? Does it's it have anything to do with nutrition? <laughs> <laughs> what? It's your diet. Um, guess what? A crappy diet makes your body hurt. What? <laughs> what? So there's kind of two things that can be wrong with the diet. Too much of some things and not enough of other things. Right. So too much of, which is the majority of the average diet, processed food, flour, sugar, vegetable oils. Those things are highly inflammatory. So even if you do have like a a micro, you know, you were talking about like a micro injury or tear to like a tendon or ligament. Yeah. Having your body mm. tilted way too far to a pro-inflammatory state can exacerbate that injury or make it much worse than mm -hmm. it otherwise should have been. Inflammation is not by itself exclusively a bad thing. Yeah. We often, it gets talked about like everything should be anti-inflammatory. It's like, no, you have inflammation for a reason. It's yeah. there to help you heal from injuries, but there needs to be a balance. Like almost everything in biology, there's this U-shaped curve. No inflammation would be terrible. You'd never be able to heal from anything. Too much inflammation is linked to every chronic disease you can think of. Yeah. Right in the middle is a nice balance of inflammation, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So the number one most important thing you can do there is stop eating processed vegetable oils. The long chain omega-6 linoleic acid is the um, building block of your inflammatory molecule. So if you less omega-6 from less vegetable oils and then more omega-3s from grass-fed beef, pastured eggs, grass-fed butter, fish, um, especially if you can, as a plug, go visit Ryan and Jasmine at Three Lakes Camp and <laughs> catch your own fish. <laughs> yep. There's some questionable stuff with um, salmon, especially farmed salmon, mm -hmm. about the quality and the microplastics and mercury. Oh, there's like yeah. questionable quality to buying commercialized fish now. Um, but certainly enjoy the lakes of Saskatchewan and go catch your own. Yeah. It'd be awesome. And I feel like even commercialized fish is better than garbage processed oh, food. So for even sure. if that's your option, right, it's it's still better than just eating a box of Kraft Dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so for otherwise healthy people, your major sources where those um, vegetable oils, plant oils are sneaking their way in is like salad dressings. Mm -hmm. Um, every, almost every commercial salad dressing is going to be soybean oil or canola oil. Yeah. Absolutely avoid that stuff. Like the toxic sludge that it is. Don't ever put that in your body. Um, the more obvious sources would be like chips, um, anything fried in a restaurant, chicken wings, French fries, sweet potato fries are no better FYI. Yeah. Um, so eliminating the fried foods and then watching out for like commercial mayo, salad dressings, that kind of stuff that can otherwise sneak its way in. Sugar, of course. Yeah. Sugar is super inflammatory. 
running a metabolism that um, oxidizes glucose more than fatty acids, just creates more oxidative stress, creates more inflammation. Yeah. Um, flour too, gluten, extremely irritating to the lining of your gut, causes all kinds of um, inflammatory problems in that respect. So try to get the big three out of your diet, flour, sugar, vegetable oil. Yeah. And then the not enough of <laughs> side of things is like nutrients, nutrition. People are eating all these vacant, empty calories and not getting enough protein, you know, cholesterol, fatty acids, um, vitamins and minerals. So while you're not eating those things, then you should start eating more red meat, primarily bone broth. Yep, get your collagen. Get your collagen. That's what builds, we were talking about the structure of the discs, that kind of like, um, I guess like a little bit rubbery, um, flexible structure. Mm -hmm. That's collagen and gelatin. Um, So you need more of that good stuff in you. A good thick bone broth, when you put it in the fridge, will have this beautiful layer that looks kind of like jello on top. That's the good stuff that helps your... Um, your discs, your tendons, your ligaments, all your joints, you know, the synovial fluid, things that lubricate and keep your joints nice and happy. Uh, your bone mineral density, when they um, diagnose osteoporosis, they take the measurements at the hip and the lumbar spine. Those are the locations that they care about because those are the fractures that ruin your life, yeah. like end your life if you have major spine or hip fractures. Other fractures are also not cool if you break an ankle or an arm or whatever, but less likely it doesn't have such a high mortality risk mm-hmm. as you age. So in order to not have spinal bone injuries, like we were talking about, you need super good bone density. Yep. You need a high amount of vitamin K2. You know, I'm like a huge advocate of K2, um, the fat of grass fed animals, beef and butter. If you're not eating a lot of grass fed animals, you should supplement with K2. Everybody should. Yep. Um, that's going to play a huge role in having this bomb proof skeleton I always talk about so you need to just eat more nutritious food right <laughs> get, a, get a nutrient get rid of the garbage none of this the healthy sawdust stuff. fluff and engine <laughs> lubricant that people are living on um and then there's some other things that can greatly affect joint pain yeah. including your back one of them is oxalates oxalate toxicity so oxalates are a little plant a naturally occurring plant like herbicide pesticide little they're like little crystally um molecules they can accumulate. So a calcium oxalate is what a kidney stone is made of. So your mm-hmm. body's attempting to excrete it, but it gets bound to calcium. And if there's too much going through the kidneys too fast, faster than it can excrete it, it builds up into a little a crystal. Yeah. Anyone that's ever had kidney stones, that's I have so not, thank I've God. Not either. But can tell you from what I've heard, it's one of the worst, most painful experiences yeah. of life. It's like up there with childbirth. Yeah. And possibly worse, yeah. apparently. God hope I never have to experience <laughs> kidney stones. Um, so your body's trying to get rid of these oxalates. One way is through the kidneys, but another way is just to push them out of circulation into the soft tissue, into mm-hmm. the into the joints and tendons and ligaments. Um, so people with oxalate overload can have like weird little lumps, like it'll try to come out your skin where it can manifest. It looks like a deep type of acne sometimes, mm. but it can happen on your jawline your hands your feet and like weird little lumpy things um so that's and they're just like crystals right it's like your body's trying to push it out right it can get stuck in the in the joints the connective tissue so it can it's kind of like a similar to like a bone spur it's a painful little crunchy thing in there this was my personal experience that i had chronic back pain for a long time like probably 10 years that finally finally resolved when i quit eating spinach and almonds right so even long after I'd been keto, tons of stuff is almonds, 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 almond flour. And then the green leafy vegetables are super high in oxalates too. So people that are like making their smoothie and stuffing it full of spinach, <laughs> do not do that. Right. There's no need to eat an excessive amount of green leafy vegetables. Um, and if anything, it can be putting an extreme amount of sp- stress on your kidneys and your joints. Mm. So that's one option to look at if you have chronic joint pain, back pain, um, and otherwise things are fairly optimized and you're like, God, why is this always sore? Yeah. The other one is nightshade vegetables. And that's has a, a strong tie to an um, autoimmunity of rheumatoid arthritis. So though your nightshade vegetables are tomatoes, eggplants, bell peppers, potatoes, sweet potatoes, that kind of stuff. Um, they have certain little compounds in them that accidentally get recognized by the immune system and look similar to your own tissue. So it causes your immune system to fight your own cartilage. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to have that happen. So people managing rheumatoid arthritis, which can be pain in your back, but also like smaller joints, knees, hips, hands, feet. Yeah. A big one is 
you avoid nightshade vegetables. So all of these things, like it's not necessarily everybody that has these major issues with these things, but if you have long-term back pain that doesn't seem to be coming from any known cause, Mm -hmm. a good way to experiment is to just like cut it all out and slowly start implementing things back in to see what, what might be causing it. I love a good self experiment. Yeah. So I think if you have chronic joint pain that like you said, you can't otherwise identify a cause, I would do a good four to six weeks of a proper elimination diet and just focus on red meat, eggs and butter, like a basically a carnivore diet for four to six weeks and then start to add the things back in one mm-hmm. at a time yeah. and see what was the trigger. And how long do you have to add them in do you think before it starts? It depends on your sensitivity to it, I think. Um, Like some things like the oxalate toxicity, I can handle small amounts of almonds now if it's like in something or a few mixed nuts. Mm -hmm. But I was just going way over the top with like almond flour muffins and almond flour coated chicken breasts and like almond butter and everything was almonds, almonds, almonds. So I can handle a little bit now, but I definitely know when I've overdone it with almonds because my back pain comes back and I get these crazy breakouts along my jawline. Right. These like deep, painful things on my jawline. So then my body's like, hey, <laughs> too much. Yeah. So it's often the dose is the poison, right? Dose Where it's like poison. a little bit is fine, but if you're eating like ridiculous amounts of something, that might mm-hmm. be a, an issue. And once you get all the inflammation to calm down and you get the balance restored, you might find that you can handle small amounts of, of your trigger food, but just not large amounts. Right. Other people, like maybe you have celiac disease and mm-hmm. even the tiniest little whiff of gluten sends <laughs> it sends you into an, an, an attack. Yeah. Um, so I think it just, it depends. Yeah. Um, but I would start with just a proper elimination diet and then experiment from there to figure out if right. if it did have a dietary cause. And I would say if you have chronic back pain, it's definitely going to feel better yeah. if you eat better. Yeah. That's <laughs> along with everything else. It. Along with everything else, <laughs> you'll sleep better. And then here's another definitely underappreciated ones, statins. Mm-hmm. Cholesterol medication. Yeah. Um statins inhibit um uh, the one step of the process in synthesizing cholesterol. Cholesterol is super important. It's a super important molecule necessary for life. You synthesize it in almost every cell of your body. Statin medications interrupt the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme at the point in the synthesis of cholesterol, Mm -hmm. Um, which will make you have less cholesterol in your blood, but has all kinds of super, super negative side effects. One of which, one of the primary negative side effects of statins is muscle pain. Right. Five to 20% of people that take statins will experience muscle pain, muscle soreness, weakness, um, stiffness, and pain. So different types of muscle dysfunction. Um, A major side effect of statins can be rhabdomyolysis, muscle breakdown. It causes such extreme muscle weakness that the muscle cells start to break down and spill myoglobin into the bloodstream, which poisons the kidneys. You, people might be familiar with the risk of rhabdo from um, overdoing it with like exercise. So you yeah. can have exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis, but more often than not, if someone presents to the emergency department with rhabdo, it's either a crush injury or a statin side effect. So increases your risk of rhabdo. Um, and muscle pain is actually the number one reason that people will stop taking their statin medications because it's so unbearable. Right. So I don't know. I'm clearly... I'm... <laughs> Not here to tell anyone what to do yeah. in terms of what medicines to take or not take. That's not, not my doctors. business. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I have no business <laughs> being between you and your doctor. It's none of my business. Yeah. But I'll share my opinion on what the decisions I've made with my health. I have high LDL cholesterol, as do you. As do I, yeah. I would never take a statin. Yeah. Never, 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 never. Nor would I let anyone I love take a statin. Yeah. Increases your risk of diabetes, increases your risk of dementia, increases your risk of muscle pain and weakness and rhabdomyolysis and like all these very, very risky side effects. Um, If you're interested in learning more about those topics, I can certainly recommend things for you to educate yourself Mm -hmm. and make your own informed decision between you and your doctor. Yeah. Um, But personally, I would never. The funny thing about statins is there's a risk of all these other things. And yet there's never been any real clear, concrete evidence that you're actually benefiting that much from taking one. Mm -hmm. What's the statistic with the lower chance of heart attack or something like that? Do you remember that one where it's like one in a hundred? So they call it the number needed to treat NNT. How many patients need to take this drug in order to prevent one adverse outcome? So depending on the risk stratification, you can use statins for primary prevention, people that have not had a heart attack but have some risk factor like elevated LDL cholesterol, mm-hmm. um, or secondary prevention. You've had a heart attack and you're trying not to have another one. In primary prevention, 
the depending on the study, the NNT is anywhere between a hundred and a thousand or upwards of like infinity. So it, that means if the NNT is a thousand, that means a thousand people have to take a statin to prevent one heart attack. Right. That means 999 people took a medication that provided them no benefit mm-hmm. and only risks and side effects. Right. And so the numbers like that, when you start to look at like some of the statistics are quite frightening. And then didn't they do one where they said they took a group of a like, hundred people and without any kind of statin treatment, three of them had a heart attack. And in the statin group, two of them had a heart attack. So it changed one out of a hundred, but then they marketed it as a 33% mm-hmm. decrease in chance of heart attack because technically two is two thirds of a of three. Mm-hmm. So they can play with the numbers and make it seem like it's way more effective, like 33% of, or 33% reduction in risk of heart attack when yeah. it was actually only one out of a hundred that actually yeah. benefited from it. Yeah, There's all kinds of stuff all over the internet about cholesterol and statins and like they're, there's a very good chance that we've been saying the wrong thing for they're less. very controversial yeah very controversial yeah and if there is any benefit to be fair it's in secondary prevention people that have already had a heart attack and are trying not to have another one but are unwilling or not interested in making any lifestyle changes yeah. whatsoever so in a person that just wants to continue to smoke or drink or eat junk food and not exercise and not take care of themselves in any way, there may be some benefit in secondary prevention of people with poor lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But you're way better off just making your lifestyle better. Yeah. <laughs> doing it the natural way. Yeah, of course. The like less medication you can take in your life, the better. You yeah. Know? One of the best things you can do is stay healthy, stay out of the healthcare system. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, and we should probably, we could do a whole episode. I might turn that into a whole online course at some point of just like understanding scientific literature Mm -hmm. and a basic understanding of statistics. There's a great book. I think it was written in like the thirties or fifties. I read it with Atlas called how to lie with statistics. Oh yeah. Um, and what you're talking about is the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. Right. So if three out of people in one group have a heart attack, three out of a hundred in one group, and then two out of a hundred in the other group, that is a 33% reduction, relative risk reduction Mm -hmm. of heart attacks, but that's actually only a 1% total risk reduction. Right. So the people in charge of, and this is where my background of having a master's in marketing comes in. Guess which one you're going to put on the poster? For sure. Of if course. You're trying to sell it. The, oh, th- you know, Lipitor reduces the risk of heart attack by 33%. You're like, oh, wow, this is like a miracle medication. Yeah. But then what happens? And people with a poor understanding of statistics will see something like that and they don't understand what that means or read the tiny fine print at the bottom. Yeah. And then you'll ask someone, doctors included, fall yeah. for this. I've seen this research is quite frightening. So you see this poster and then they'll ask a physician, if you prescribe this medication to a thousand patients, how many heart attacks do you anticipate that you're preventing? And they'll answer 330. And the actual answer is maybe 10. Yeah. You know, and you're like, ooh, that's a real serious difference in understanding what those statistics represent. Because the marketing company is saying it has a 33% Reduction. Relative and, risk reduction. Yeah, but they're not saying the relative. They're just saying a 33% risk in heart attacks. So the doctor says, well, 33% of 1,000 people, that's 330 lives I'm saving. Mm-hmm. When it's, it's like, not no, at all. it's actually maybe 10 people, yeah. and you're risking all the side effects and yeah. whatever unnecessary medications for the rest of them. So, yes, I would love to rant about statins for a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of really interesting stuff There's out there. There's a lot so of data out there. On LDL, HDL, like all cholesterol stuff and statins, and, you know, you can you can find a plethora of it. Mm-hmm. We should and will do a whole episode on that kind of stuff. Lipids. Yeah. Love lipid metabolism. Um, but, yes, as a source of potential uh, back pain, muscle pain, without any other known cause, you generally eat well, sleep well, move well. And you're like, why do my muscles hurt all the time? If you're taking a statin medication, that would be the next big Mm -hmm. suspect for what's going on. And again, talk about it with your doctor. Talk about it with your doctor. It's none of my business of what goes on between you and your doctor. Yep. Okay. So back pain. Back pain 101. 101. Move better. Understand how your spine is supposed to move most of the time. Yep. Keep it in the position it's happiest most of the time. Yep. Build a buffer with a good, strong core. Stretch the front. Strengthen the back. Yeah. Um, move well all the time. Yep. Every movement counts. Um, clean up your diet. That's going to benefit everything. Yeah. <laughs> Less flour, sugar, vegetable oil, more nutritious red meat, eggs, butter, bone broth, big time. Treat yourself to a new bed or just a sheet of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> Address your sleeping positions. Yep. 
try to sleep in a better spot. And if you still can't find a cause, maybe look for some of the lesser known um, oxalate foods, nightshade vegetables, statin medicines, anything that could be um, a more nefarious trigger Mm -hmm. those things. All right. Cool. Back pain. Stay healthy, everyone. See you next time. See you in the next one.